thank you so much again for um, good good. talks and very useful. So I think, um, so maybe I'll start by saying that to me, um, we've seen different use cases. I think clinical data means different things to different people. It means uh, sometimes um, uh, insurance um, claims related information. Sometimes it means genetic variants that if somebody wants to do cutting edge research like we see here locally in San Diego, many, many places do that. So um, I guess I, I'd reach out to the audience, but I do think that like, I want to ask my panelists, so what do you think is the most important thing in the data integration, clinical data integration situation? Is it tools? Is it ontologies? All of the above? Or is it something else entirely? And whoever wants to start, please do. I can start. There's actually a meeting at NCI last week on Thursday and Friday just to talk about data integration. And uh, several of the issues were highlighted. One of the issues was it basically starts with consent because a lot of data share is not possible unless you have uh, some kind of a consent. In fact, um, one of the partnerships that are, you know, among a lot of nonprofit partnerships that have started recently is Orion. And well, Orion has been in existence for about 10, 12 years but they just started expanding beyond Merck and Moffitt. And they started with a common consen consent that all the centers who signed this time, they, they signed the total cancer care consent uh, from the patients. So now their data and the tissues can be shared. So I think one of the barriers is consent. The other is data harmonization and normalization. And the third is just the mechanisms for sharing. So there are a lot of, these, a lot of issues, but it all starts with, do you even have consent from patients in order to share the data? I could just make a comment about consent because we've been talking about that for years and years. It's it, that's easier said than done. It's collecting a consent and explaining to the patient what they're consenting to. I mean, you all do you know consent for for research, and sometimes it's the 12 pages and all the time. But in a clinical environment, I mean, you go to your doctor's office; they have you in and out. So explaining that consent and then keeping track of that consent. Okay, and then what happens when they want to change the consent? So sometimes the consent will actually cause you problems. Okay, so instead, so that's kind of like the opting in and opting out situation. I know at many organizations they have, as part of their HIPAA um, privacy statement, they just basically say we will be using your data for um, for research. Now that covers data, not not um, sam samples and, and that type of thing. But 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 I agree with you. That's that's such a small thing, but huge. Can I bring up something about that consent? You know, I don't know if anybody done 23andMe, right? When you do the 23andMe, do you consent to have your samples available for research? Well, everybody's going to want that, right? Now, imagine they said, do you consent to let us use your data so we can make money off of it? The consents would have been vastly different. So when somebody's doing internal research, everybody thinks it's, it's a great thing to contribute to. But this well, seems but to with be 23andMe, we did agree to that. Right. Yeah, and they have. Yeah, that's right. We all know that now, yeah. right? But I'm just saying that, that that how that consent looks and how people interact with the for profit with the, the, this type of open sharing, I think it's going to make a big difference in terms of how rapidly things can advance. A lot of people don't understand. One of the problems with consent at the I2B2 level, when you're talking about clinical care, is that people don't understand research, even what research is. I mean, that's why research accruals are so bad. People don't understand what research is. And they don't trust it. And they don't trust research at all. And a lot of, and a lot of that's public press, that's, that's unfortunately. <laughs> they all want it. Everybody wants the results of research, but, you know, participating. Now, the, yesterday's presentation on the PPMI study, the Parkinson's progressive marker uh, that Michael J. Fox is fun, is fun, that's an incredible model. And they were oversubscribed for that study. So we should be looking at what they're doing because they, they nailed it. But why? How did they do it? They got Michael J. Fox to agree to uh, to do it. It's educating <laughs> and promoting. Yeah. Yeah. What's that? It has examples. It's like a whole company. Patients like me. Mm -hmm. That's what they do. They Patients like me has a different model, and they have had trouble monetizing it. I can tell you that. But they didn't tell patients what they were doing with the data, and that led to problems. So 
I think when they initially started it, they weren't going to do that, right? Because right? they were doing it for sort of like philanthropic and, and reasons, and then, yeah. then they changed. Yeah. But yeah, so, I have a question, which is a, a little bit different than our spec point of view about native. So, are you guys considering? In a, so, so my background is basically new chroma and transmart. I'm very interested in the big data analytics. So probably coming years, you know, you probably see unstructured data more, or on you know, the design in the patient or population. And you know, I think more important discovery could be found with such a huge amount of data set. So uh, are you guys considering you know, that direction of facts on what you guys are working on now, you know, some limitation or some potentials, you know, probably? I mean, the largest databases we're going to have are going to be the PCORnet networks or ACT if, it, if that happens. And it's going to be very hard to access. I mean, it's, unfortunately, it, and it's only discrete data. But there is, I think you could do some big data analysis if you could get everyone to agree to put that data into a central place. But, I mean, we have Medi the uh, Medicare data is available. Have you ever tried using that? Well, my question is, for example, so if you have a, such a huge data, your hardware is not fully, you know, the, and, and, and the I2B2 transmit all single load in a base approach, doesn't support distributed database yet, unless you plug in, uh, you know, the... What, I2B2? I2B2 is uh, running on cluster system? It can, it can run on anything. That's, the performance isn't the issue. The well, issue... If you have, uh, you know, for example, 10 million, you know, the genome sequence data from Google, if sometimes, you know, it's available. I2B2 can handle it? I'm not sure what, you're, what handling it means, though. What question are you trying to answer? I2B2 would answer the question. It's based on SQL. So we believe SQL is not scalable like No, I2B2 is not about loading genomic no, data not. into SQL. Exactly. Data. It's not. It's, it's absolutely not about that. And yeah. Never was meant to be, and not how it works. Transmart's that yeah. part of I2B2, actually. Let's take a question from the back of the room. Yes, yes. Yeah. I just wanted to actually comment on the Fox Foundation. Comment. So, hi, my name is Rachel Lindsay. I work for the Michael Bay Fox Foundation. Um, and I'm thrilled that PPMI has been referenced several times yesterday and today. That's, um, that's kind of the point of it, which is excellent. But to the point of that use agreements um, and with respect to patient uh, agreements to utilize their data, um, it's actually a bit more um, fundamental, if you will. So, what we did when we launched PPMI was because there was a lumbar puncture associated multiple times throughout this five-year study, and we were very concerned about retention, we put a huge amount of effort and structure into educating PIs and clinicians at every point um, that a patient encounters someone in their um, experience in PPMI to educate patients on why the study is incredibly relevant, the infrastructure and investment that's going into it, why each person's participation is so critically important the outcomes that we were expecting from it, and to also educate people appropriately on what is a lumbar puncture, and not to scare people off. Um, and we did this across you know, different types of samples and kind of observations that people will be going through as well that test the bigger consumer of lumbar puncture. We also integrate um, significant amounts of retention tools, and that's a little bit separate than kind of the current discussion, but I guess my point is there was a lot of just like person-to-person -person interaction that we invested in and ensured was structured to make patients comfortable with signing the data agreements that they were signing. And you can attest to this as your, um, as your part of the study. Yeah. <laughs> so I just wanted to put it out there. <laughs> The, the question is, how did PPMI, well, obviously have Michael J. Fox in, as the figurehead there, but the recruitment, the, the healthy arm that I'm part of was oversubscribed, yeah. which is phenomenal when you think about what, was, what we go through on the healthy side. So how do we get that into the hospital systems? People should be walking into hospital systems and seeing signs that say, what is clinical research? And there was a program at UMass called uh, Conquering Diseases. And one of our first I2B2 systems became part of this conquering diseases. They were going to put a kiosk up. People were going to come in and agree that next time they went in for a regular blood draw, 
there would be an extra uh, tube collected for the biobank. And I don't know how far they got with that, but I never did see kiosks in the hospital. But so what we're seeing, I guess, and what everybody is saying is that the integration actually starts at the patient level yes. at correctly organizing their data usage and um, what are they called, the consent forms, um, uh, data usage agreements and whatever it, uh, other paperwork is there to lay the groundwork for later data integration because we're seeing that efforts when people try to build on top of their databases that were not meant to be integrated with anything, that's just basically falls flat, right? So we need to start thinking about it. And it would be good that, you know, if we have even references to these resources, if they are available as a, you know, help section or whatever it is, as a part of documentation, my favorite word today. And so, and just basically uh, alert people to, okay, so you cannot do this unless you have this, this, and this done and hopefully done properly. But another aspect of it is tools, and I wanted to ask a, a question of uh, Rachel. So while listening to your presentation, it's really great and everything. It reminded me to a certain extent of Galaxy. Mm -hmm. And so uh, great idea, you have a collection of tools which you obviously need to, to do your data integration. The problem is how do users know which tool is good, which tool is not good? And I think you touched up on that and said mm -hmm. you validate some tools. Can you elaborate on that? And what's your recommendation to others? Sure. So we validated a number of uh, tools and pipelines for you know, the various use cases that, that either we have done internally or our clients have had. Um, <laughs> as soon as I have time to write them, okay. yeah. <laughs> Um, but, you know, I mean, there are some published papers also. also. But, you know, in terms of, you know, bioinformatics pipelines and, and sort of validation, we focus on, at least within our software, on offering sort of community gold standard tools. So in a way, that's a hindrance because we're not at the cutting edge of bioinformatics. So if you're doing something that's really new and novel in bioinformatics, you're going to have to, uh, you know, you're going to have to wrap your own process. You can use our software, but we're not going to ship with that. Um, because, you know, there aren't going to be as many use cases just from a purely commercial approach. You know, that would serve as three guys instead of 300. Um, Galaxy is an incredible resource for bioinformatics, but we, we've adopted a strategy of really fostering a collaboration between bioinformaticians and experts who can make educated choices about the right tools to use and having them support the life scientists. Whereas I think a lot of tools um, make it easier for the biologist to kind of click and play with bioinformatics, which is laudable in its own right but can also lead to you know, either poor decision making or p-value chasing or that sort of thing. Um, and, and also, you know, it's, bioinformatics is a discipline. They, people get their PhDs in it. People make lifetimes of study out of it. It's not something that me as a, a you know, washed up scuba diver turned molecular biologist can just say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go do all my bioinformatics now without serious study. Um, and there's subtypes of them. Yeah, <laughs> and there's subtypes of them. I want to just turn it around though and ask a question about tools to the audience and to the panel. Um, I have a, a, just an intellectual interest in na uh, natural language processing. And I'm wondering what role do you think that sort of approach and tools around that will help in, in the data integration versus say just a brute force approach of human curation? So I'll, I'll take the question first. We have also built an NLP platform called Spirit NLP and we've also played around uh, with uh, several other tools. So we, we have license to Lingvomatics, which is a commercial NLP tool that is used increasingly now in life sciences, including in cancer research. Uh, our own platform currently uh, integrates uh, CTEX and MetaMap and kind of does you know best of both worlds in order to do the clinical uh, document analysis using NLP. And we've also played around with TIES, which is specifically focused on pathology and radiology nodes. Um, I think you know, a lot of it depends on what kind of ontologies you use uh, and what tools you use. But there is also increasing, so we are also working on disease registries now. And one of the things that, you know, uh, one of our informatics uh, leaders at City of Hope proposed natural language processing, and most of the clinicians, including the head of clinical research, said, well, I really don't want to go back and analyze, and we would have, as data scientists or as people who are interested in informatics, we would have thought that there's incredible value in going back and looking at the clinical notes and digging out data as like a recurrence and what drugs were prescribed and how would they relate to you know 
the uh, either the recurrence or staging and all the other things. And the doctor, the clinicians who were who are going to use the disease registries made a statement that all the and this person is world renowned lung cancer specialist and he said and he understands informatics really really well and he said five years ago I don't use any of the drugs that were prescribed five years ago and I the diseases the way they are analyzed the markers the drugs all of them have changed so what am I going to get if you were to look back at the data so I think there is also a, you know uh, an issue as to what kind of demand is there from the users in terms of going back. Now, if you can integrate the NLP with the EMR at the end, you're, if there are notes that are being uh, contemporarily being written and you're extracting information and you digest that information, that is very useful. But as a retrospective, not as much. That's interesting. So a lot of data, we're talking about clinical data, a lot of data that goes into EPIC, for example, is actually when a clinician writes the notes up, there's an overlay from a company called IMO, and there are other companies as well that provide this overlay. And it will look at the note at that point and provide a list of discrete data that can be entered in, ICD-9 codes, et cetera. And that, to me, is the best application of uh, NLP. To standardize the input. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And to collect discrete data that the clinician then validates. Marcy? Well, I was just saying, but I think And the, and the reason the coding is bad is because all they need the codes for is to collect money. When, the, they need that, when they need those codes to keep people from getting sick, and there was an article on NPR this morning about this, this whole thing about the, you know, a new, the capitated model. Well, oh, that's a terrible name for it. But eventually what you need is a system, research becomes embedded in the healthcare system. And Marcy's slides had LHS, she didn't tell you what that meant. It means learning health system. And it's a concept that's been around for a while. It's, it's not as, people aren't talking about it. But eventually we have to get to, you know, I call them the scariest three words I've ever heard. Evidence-based medicine, right? Because what's the other kind, right? <laughs> well, the other kind is what we, we do. We, the institutions do. It's and trial and error medicine. It's trial and error, and the patients don't realize it. That's the problem. Patients are scared by research, why? They, don't, you do, don't you know? How could you be researching? And the doctor's like, yeah, I know. You know and, they, and they say they do, and of course, they don't. Because they don't have any evidence base for what they're doing. And that's the problem. And that's a much bigger problem than the, the research that is necessarily going on right here. But that's the bigger problem within which all this research is being done. So, so one area where potentially NL, uh, NLP will get funding from is um, in the area of data abstraction for registry, for uh, reporting to state and federal uh, registries. So for example, for California at CNEXT, now you need to extract data from a lot of different nodes and kind of correlate. So you have information like patient has come for visit many, many times to different providers and different kinds of doctors. And you need to look at all these nodes and abstract data and then put it in uh, CNEXT. Now that is the kind of work that can be made much more efficient if NLP was run through that. So it, it becomes part of a workflow, and now it becomes a tool that is actually cost savings at the, at the cost of a lot of jobs, obviously. But that is a place where NLP will potentially get a lot more funding. So I would like to mention on NLP. If I look at, if I correct, the I2B2 has an NLP module. There's one, it's called the annotation cell. It's based on a traditional approach. Now, for example, this is actually can actually mine, uh, discover the same kind of an algorithm for you know, the voice recognition, text mining, even for genomic sequence. 
So you know, the analysis wise, you know, the paradigm is shifting. So not only just natural language, but it's the same technology can be utilized for very different type of data set if this is you know, very you know, the complex and you know, the, you know, enormous. Yeah. Right. I see. Yes. There's one more. Question. One, one, one more. <laughs> uh, in your action B2 demonstration you had at the very beginning, there was, it looked like an fMRI study, a brain yes. scan. All right. So it, how easy is that to use? Does it have to be coded by people? And if I said, I want to find people that have up or down in the posterior cingulate cortex, can I find those kind of patients to find out what's going on with that? Do you know where that slide came from? Yeah. That slide with the MRI? The uh, image? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do, you know, go ahead. Go ahead. do you know? I mean, I thought he made it up. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. They, no. Well, it was. It was a. It was not part. It's not part of I2B2 unless um, Chris finished his uh, My2B2 medical imaging for I2B2. Did yeah, that ever get done? It came from My2B2. My yeah. So, but it's not all images. It's only a subset. But that image is. That image is much older than that. Really? That image that you had is from 2005 or 2006. Yeah. It's been around a long time. I mean, see, that has, what was it, medial prefrontal cortex activation. I have no so idea. So if, if a doctor went through and, and annotated all the bits in this and that, you could probably search for it. But yeah. nobody's going to do that. Okay. Especially most of, the, most of the really cool, innovative research, they were looking for one thing, and then they found default mode by looking at um, other types of things that were available. So if somebody wants to do a new search on something that wasn't coded, can you get to it in this kind of data? Now, now so it, okay. that, I'll answer one question yeah. that was just discussed over in the other room. Uh, in Transmark 16.2, there's an integration with the x -Net platform. So you can take any kind of uh, clinical imaging and integrate that with its metadata as well as the full images into, into Transmark. And one of the things I don't know if we talked about here, but um, one thing that's been very interesting is, is all of VIAC at Harvard has integrated i 2 to and Transmark together in a prototype and actually use it for recording uh, grants. Yeah quite successful um, and for building patient registry. So I think uh, taking some of the work that's been done on the research side with, with trans work, like this clinical imaging, and putting that together with, with ITV2, you get functionality that crosses both sides of the product. Um, so I think there's there's a lot of possibility of doing that in the future. And if you just have those images there, and then you go back to deep learning and machine learning, um, you can go and train a system and go and, and build that uh, uh, that diagnosis images data. Data. Actually, there's a guy at Michigan. Uh, uh, what's his name? Um, Yul. Oh, Yul yeah, Yul Bayless. Yeah, Yul Bayless, who's using some DoD software uh, sure. that's uh, designed for ta uh, targeting missiles, and he's used it to target to look there for. It's a really active space in the startup world too. So in yeah. five or ten years, the winners of that will rise. And you know, Semantic yeah. MD is doing that out of uh, MD Anderson, I think, and. Um, there's another the San Francisco company called, uh, I'll think of it as soon as you guys aren't listening. Anyway, there's a, a, you know, and they're doing this sort of like high throughput histology, basically, where the, the microscopes are automated to run through slides, and then the computer yeah. scores the, yeah. you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Well, guys, we have to wrap up. We kind of ran over, but not by much. So uh, thank you so much for attending the session. Please attend all the other sessions as well that are, are left, and I hope you enjoyed that. So let's Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.